Good morning. Good morning. Good morning to all of you. It's a real pleasure to be here uh, today. And uh, I would like to thank the organizers. Um, I can think of Ravi, I can think of the Singapore authorities at large for having us participate in your three days event. Did you notice that it was rainy this morning? Yeah, a little bit. Singapore is also well known for its winds. It is often windy. Winds here bring about change, change and opportunity. Historically, winds generally blew ships to the port. These ships resupplied while waiting for the monsoon to pass, for the seasons to change. And as the Greek philosopher Heraclitus of Ephesus would have said, change is the only constant. Singapore knows this. You know this. It is the true spirit of the FinTech Festival, opening doors to the new digital future, hoisting sails to the winds of change. And yet, change often appears daunting, unsettling, destabilizing, disrupting, especially true for technological change. They disrupt our habit, our emotions, our jobs, our social interaction for better or for worse. The key is to harness the benefits while managing the risks. When it comes to fintech, Singapore has shown exceptional vision. Think of the regulatory sandbox where new ideas can be tested. Think of the fintech innovation lab and its collaboration with major central banks on cross-border payments. So in this context, and in my position as head of the IMF, I would like to explore three particular areas. First, I want to frame the issue in terms of the changing nature of money and the fintech revolution. Second, I would like to evaluate the role of central banks in this new financial landscape, especially in relation to providing digital currency, and third, I would like to look at the downsides, the risks, if you will, and consider how they can be minimized. Let me begin with th the big issue, the change of money. How is money changing? When commerce was local, centered around the town square, money in the form of token, shells to begin with, metal coins eventually, was sufficient and it was efficient. The exchange of coins from one hand to another settled transactions. So long as the coins were valid, and that was determined by just glancing, inspecting, scratching, or sometimes biting into them, it did not matter which hand held them. But as commerce went maritime, on ships like those that passed through Singapore and covered increasingly greater distance, carrying those coins became expensive, risky, cumbersome, heavy. So Chinese paper money introduced in the ninth century helped, but not quite enough. Innovation produced bills of exchange pieces of paper allowing merchants with a bank account in their home city to draw money from a bank at their destination. The Arabs called these SAK, abbreviation for Sukuk, the origin of our word check today. And these checks and the banks that went along with them spread around the world, spearheaded by the Italian bankers and the merchants of the Renaissance. Other examples are the Chinese Chanzi and the Indian Hundi bills. And suddenly, it mattered who you dealt with. Was this Venetian or Persian merchant, merchant the rightful owner of that bill? Was the bill trustworthy? Was that Chanzi bank going to accept it? Trust became essential. And the state became the guarantor of that trust by offering liquidity, 
backstop and supervision. Why do I take you through a little bit of history background? Well, because the fintech revolution questions the two forms of money that we just discussed, coins and commercial bank deposit. And it questions the role of the state in providing money. We are at a historic turning point. You, young or not so young, doesn't matter, but bold entrepreneurs gathered here today, you are not just inventing new services, you are reinventing the history of money. You're drawing a completely new future, actually. And we are all in the process of adapting. A new wind is blowing, and it is that of digitalization. And in this new world, we meet anywhere, anytime, as they said. And surprise, surprise, the town square is back. Back on your smartphone. We exchange information, services, even emojis, instantly, peer-to-peer, -peer, person to person. We float through a world of information where data is the new gold, despite growing concerns about privacy, about cyber attacks. A world in which millennials are reinventing how our economy works, phone in hand. And this is key. Money itself is changing. We expect it to become more convenient, more user-friendly, perhaps even less serious-looking. We expect it to be integrated with social media, readily available for online and person-to-person -person use, including micropayments. And of course, we ex expect it to be cheap, safe, protected against criminals and prying eyes. So, what role will remain for cash in this digital world? There are already signs in some shop windows. Cash not accepted. And it's not just in Scandinavia, the poster child of a cashless world. In various other countries too, demand for cash is decreasing, as is shown in our IMF work. And in 10, 20, 30 years' time, who will still be exchanging those pieces of paper called checks? Bank deposit, too, is feeling the pressure from new forms of money. Think of the new specialized payment providers that offer e-money. From Alipay to WeChat in China, to Paytm in India, to M-Pesa in Kenya, these forms of money are designed with the digital economy in mind. They respond to what people demand and what the economy requires. Even cryptocurrencies such as Bitcoin, Ethereum and Ripple are vying for a spot in the cashless world, constantly reinventing themselves in the hope of offering more stable value and quicker and cheaper settlement. Let me now turn to my second issue. What is the role of the state? What is the role of a central bank in that new monetary landscape? Some suggest that the state should back off, should back down. Providers of e-money argue that they, are, that they are less risky than banks because they do not lend money. Instead, they hold client funds in custodian accounts and simply settle payments within the network. For their part, cryptocurrencies seek to anchor trust in technology. And as long as they are transparent and you are techie savvy, you might trust their services. Still, I'm not entirely convinced proper regulation of these entities will remain a pillar of trust. Now, should we go further? Beyond regulation, should the state remain an active player in the market for money? Should it fill the void left by the retreat of cash? Let me be more specific. 
Should central banks issue a new digital form of money? A state bank token, or perhaps an account held directly at the central bank and available to people and firms for retail payments, to each of you? True, your deposits in commercial banks are already digital. But a digital currency would be a liability of the state, like cash today, not of a private firm, the central bank, the state. And this is not science fiction. There are central banks around the world that are considering this option. In countries like Canada, like China, like Sweden, like Uruguay. And they are embracing change and new thinking, as indeed we are at the IMF. Today, we are releasing a new paper, which I was supposed to flag for you. So imagine there is a paper in my hand, except that it's available online. And it's called I actually don't have the name of the paper. That's very interesting. But it's all about the pros and cons of central bank digital currencies, also called CBDC, if you want to sound really aware. So check on that paper, really interesting. And I believe that we should consider the possibility to issue digital currency. There is a role for the state to supply money to the digital economy. To satisfy public policy goals that you are familiar with, such as inclusion, security and consumer protection, to provide what the private sector cannot provide, and also privacy in payment. Let, let me start with financial inclusion, where digital currency offers great promise through its ability to reach people and businesses in remote and marginalized regions. We know, we know that banks are not exactly rushing to serve poor or rural areas. And this is critical because cash might no longer be an option here. If the majority of people adopt digital forms of money, the infrastructure for cash would deteriorate, leaving those in the periphery behind. What about subsidizing cash usage in those areas? Well, that means that economic life in the periphery would become disconnected from the center, not very satisfactory solution either. Now, of course, offering a digital currency is not necessarily the only answer. There may be scope for government to encourage private sector solutions as well, by providing funding or improving infrastructure. The second benefit of digital currency relates to security and consumer protection. And this is really a David versus Goliath argument. In the old days, coins and paper notes may have checked the dominant position of the large global payment firms, banks, clearing houses, and network operators, simply by offering a low cost hmm, and widely available alternative. Without cash, too much power would fall into the, the hands of a small number of outsized private payment providers. Payments, after all, naturally lean towards monopolies. The more people you serve, the cheaper and the more useful the service. We are seeing it in many countries already. For a start, private firms may underinvest in security to the extent that they do not measure the full cost to society of a payment failure. Resilience may also suffer. With only a few links in the payment chains, the system may stop working if any of the link actually is deteriorating, if there is a glitch, a bankruptcy, or a firm withdrawals from the market. Now, you will say what the state does well is regulate, but regulation simply might not be able to fully redress these downsides. A digital currency could offer advantages as a backstop means of payment and it could boost competition by offering a low-cost and efficient alternative, as did its grandfather, the old reliable paper note. 
Let me touch on the third benefit now of digital currency, and I would like to highlight uh, the privacy domain. Cash, of course, allows for anonymous payments. We reach for cash to protect our privacy, our identity for legitimate reasons, to avoid exposure to hacking and customer profiling, for instance. Let's take just an example. Imagine, imagine yourself purchasing, okay, frozen pizza and beer. Ooh. Now, surprisingly, consumers of frozen pizzas and beer, in my example, are associated with um, higher mortgage default than those who actually consume bro organic broccoli and exquisite wine. Hmm. What can you do if you're really craving for pizza and beer and yet you do not want your credit score to drop? You're not going to go for broccoli. You will pull out cash. And tomorrow? Would a privately owned payment system push you to the broccoli side? Would central banks jump to the rescue and offer a fully anonymous digital currency? Certainly not, because that would be a bonanza, not for broccolis, but for criminals. And that brings me to my third area. I'll come back to the pizza later. The potential downsides of digital currency. The obvious ones are risks to financial integrity and financial stability. But I would also like to highlight risks to stifling innovation, risk of stifling innovation, which is obviously the last thing that we want. My main point will be that we should face these risks creatively. How might we alleviate them by designing digital currency in new and innovative ways? And I think that technology has actually the response to that. But let's return to the trade-off between privacy and financial integrity. Can we find the middle ground? Now, central banks might design digital currencies so that users' identities would be authenticated through customer due diligence procedures and transactions recorded. By the but the identities would not be disclosed to either third parties or governments unless it was so required by law. So when I purchase my pizza and my beer, the supermarket, the supermarket's bank, their marketers would not know who I am. The state might not either, at least by default. But anti-money laundering and terrorist financing controls would nevertheless run in the background. And if a suspicion arose, it would be possible to lift the veil of anonymity and to investigate. This setup would be good for users, bad for criminals, better for the state relative to cash. And of course, challenges remain. But my goal at this point is that we should not give up and we should explore those options and see whether they can be made to work. The second risk relates to financial stability. Digital currencies could exacerbate the pressure on bank deposits we discussed earlier. If digital currencies are sufficiently similar to commercial bank deposits because they are very safe, can be held without limit, allow for payments of any amount, perhaps even offer interest, then why hold a bank account at all? But banks are not going to be passive bystanders. They can compete with higher interest rates and better services. What about the risk of bank runs? It exists. But consider that people run when they believe that cash withdrawals are honored on a first-come, first-served basis. The early birds get the worms. Digital currency instead, because it can be distributed much more easily and faster than cash, could reassure even the person who's left lying on the couch, eating pizza. 
In addition, if depositors are running to foreign assets, they will also shun the digital currency. And in many countries, they are already liquid and safe assets to run towards anyway. Think of mutual funds that only hold government bonds, for instance. So the jury is still out on whether digital currencies would really upset financial stability. And again, we need to continue to explore. Let me come to the third risk. If digital currency became too popular, it might ironically stifle innovation. Where is your role? Where is your role? If the central bank offers a full service solution, from digital wallet to token to back end settlement services, what if instead central banks entered a partnership with the private sector, with some of you? banks or other institutions and said, you interface with the customer. That's what you do best. You store their wealth. You offer interest, advice, loans. But when it comes time to transact, we take over. How would this look like? Let's go back to our pizza. Hopefully by then it's still warm. When you buy it, at the click of a button, your bank transfers funds to digital currency held at the central bank. In turn, the central bank immediately forwards it to the supermarket's bank, which would credit the supermarket's accounts. All of that in a split of a second. All nearly for free and any time. Do you see what just happened? The central bank is now the trusted intermediary. The advantage is clear. Your payment would be immediate, safe, cheap and semi-anonymous, as you wanted. Meanwhile, your bank or fellow entrepreneurs would have ensured a friendly user experience based on the latest technologies. Putting it another way, the central bank focuses on its comparative advantage, back-end settlement, and financial institutions and startups are free to focus on what they do best, client interface, innovation, providing new services. This is a public-private partnership at its best. So let me conclude here. I have tried to evaluate the case this morning for digital currency. The case is based on new and evolving requirements for money, as well as essential public policy objectives. My message is that while the case for digital currency is not universal, we should investigate it further, seriously, carefully and creatively. More fundamentally, the case is about change. Being open to change, embracing it, shaping it. Technology will change, will change us. So we should change as well. Lest we remain the last leaf on a dead branch, the others having decided to fly with the wind. In the world of fintech, we need to harness change so it is fair, it is safe, it is efficient, it is dynamic, it is inclusive. That was actually the goal of the Bali fintech agenda that were, we launched in Bali at the time of the annual meeting of the IMF and the World Bank last October. When the winds of change pick up, what will guide us to towards progress in that journey? Will it be the North Star as the captains followed in the Strait of Singapore? Malacca? And today and tomorrow, who will guide us? Let me suggest that we follow a girl, a young girl, a fearless girl. If you're lucky, you might even be able to meet her in person in New York's financial district. She's bold, she's brave, she's confident. She faces forward towards the future with grit and determination. A future she herself is going to shape with eyes wide open 
eagerly, steadily. And she says to us, sail ahead. I'm not afraid. That's the challenge that we have. Thank you. And thank you, Madame Lagarde.